Fade Tokun is known around Africa as a pastor of pastors, as his itinerant teaching ministry has helped to equip so many leaders. Tonight we discuss his book, He That Is Born of God, and his call for us to return to the core of the gospel so that we can experience true victory. Today on Chip Stock Africa. Before we do that, please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody. From Cape Town to Cairo and from Mogadishu to Dakar, this is Chim's Talk Africa. And now here's your host, Chim Onyibilanma. Hi there, welcome to this week's episode of your show. I'm Chim Onyebilama, your host. Thank you so much for joining us. My conversation with Pade today is something I believe every single church, every single believer across the continent needs to listen to. But before we go into that, I just want to share with you a heart cry for the Takarana people in Northern Madagascar. This is an ethnic group that numbers about 210,000. And they are over 80% Muslims. Now, the story is this, that several decades ago, several centuries ago, about 200 years ago, when the majority uh, people in Madagascar, the Sakalava people with their kings were conquering the land, these people cried out and made a vow among themselves that if they can be protected from being conquered by these uh, Sakalava people, they would give themselves to Islam. And they went, they, were, they, were, they found protection under the caves. That's where your name comes from. Uh, that Tankarana means cave where they hid. And after that time, they gave themselves over to Islam. There's over 80% today who are Muslims. And uh, can you imagine that born to Islam? But God desires that these people will be saved. That's why I'm calling today, because it's not just that these people gave themselves to Islam, it's that there are very few missionaries among them. Recently, we were saying that if we can get four new additional missionaries among these people, it will make a huge difference among these hundreds of thousands of people. Imagine getting out of this thing I'm sharing with you. One of you who will say I will go today. That will make a huge difference among these people in northern Madagascar. Would you consider to go? The, the type of Islam practices here is syncretic. That means they add a lot of witchcraft, a lot of, a lot of uh, consultation of the dead to it. There is serious issues of possession of, by demons. People are afraid of witches. What a ripe ground for the gospel to be managed Manifest. What will happen if a Christian who understood the power of the resurrected Christ, the power of Jesus over demons will go there and begin to preach and pray for these people? It will just, it will just be a massive open door. Will you consider adding the tang, Tankarana people of northern Madagascar into your prayer? Would you consider going? Perhaps God is laying on your heart to go as a laborer there. We would like to talk with you. Or maybe you want to support some of our missionaries that are already working in Madagascar. Uh, we have missionaries on the ground there. Would you please use the information on your screen today? Let us know what God has put in your heart to do about the harvest in northern Madagascar. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to share with you. Now let's go to my interview with Pade. Please don't go away. Welcome there, viewers, to this segment of your show. Like I said in the introduction, my guest today is Pade Tokun. Pade Tokun is the author of the book, He That Is Born of God, and this is what we want to look at today. Pade Tokun is known for his itinerant ministry around Africa. Pade, you're welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, why did you write this book? Actually, uh as I move around many churches in different parts of uh, the continent in Africa and uh, different denominations, I noticed that a lot has been done. Uh, many Christians, but at the same time, I notice that there are a lot of confusions. There are a lot of 
a lot of ignorance, a lot of uh, mess, not because people don't believe, but sometimes people believe without knowing what to believe. So uh, I notice also, obviously, that there's a lot of defeat when there's supposed to be victory. Uh, I notice that uh, many times we have what we call uh, non-Christian Christians. What do you mean by that? That is, they are Christians, but at the same time, they are Christians in, their, in, their, in what they profess, in what they say. They are Christians by looking at it from some angles. They are Christians because they said they have accepted the Lord. But when you look at their lives and you compare to the Word of God, there is a lot of difference. Uh, what you see in their, life, in their lives may be different from what the Bible says concerning them. Uh, for example, the Bible says that he that is born of God overcomes. But it is obvious that many don't overcome. Uh, we see it not only in their lives, we see it in homes, Christian homes that are breaking. We see it in Christians that are in all kinds of scandals. We see it in how they handle their positions of authority in such a way that they are not making any difference where they are. They are not making any difference in their families. They are not making any difference in their countries. They are not making any difference in their working place. Uh, you know, when you just read the Bible, the New Testament, you have the impression that when a Christian is somewhere, he makes some difference. But it is obvious that we have Christians, many Christians, that don't make any difference. Wow. You know, you, you go to the root of it in chapter 1. I read somewhere in chapter 1 where you say that uh, the, the, you try to look at, the, that was page 21, where you say this adulterated gospel, referring, of course, to what you are talking about, the fact that there is a kind of way we are presenting this gospel that is slightly or fundamentally different from what is in the Bible. You said this adulterated gospel presents Jesus as an added element to our life to do for us what we want, an able assistant to execute our plans. His presence in the believer is defined more from the perspective of his usefulness to us than from that of his lordship over us. No wonder people that receive Jesus from that perspective cannot see him as lord to worship or as a friend with whom to fellowship. To them, Jesus is a means or a tool. It is an error that creates an irresolvable conflict between our interest and that of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The result is that he will not manifest himself in your life. God will not release his power into your life until you understand that you cannot use him to realize your ambition. What is this conflict of interest you are talking about? Yes, you see, uh, first of all, uh, when people receive Jesus, Many people that receive Jesus today, I have noticed, is that they are not really interested in the person of Jesus or who he says he is or who the Bible says he is. They are interested uh, in him, uh, not in him, but in his power that they need. It is like somebody that has a big problem and they say, this man, Jesus, can solve your problem. And all you need to do is to say, Jesus, I want you to help me. Is there anything wrong with people coming like that to Jesus? It is very wrong because you have not found out what is the intention of the Lord. And these so are that's the kind of his interest versus your interest. That is it. That is his interest. That is um, his interest. What, you see, what Jesus wants to do in your life is more global, is more encompassing. But you are not interested in many of the areas that the Lord wants to touch in your life, for example. Let me just give an obvious example. Somebody has a lot of struggles in his life. Jesus is looking for how to help him that his life, that, that person's life will honor God. But that person feels, no, all I need is for my business to, to prosper. Mm. So 
There are many things that the Lord wants to do in his life, but he's not interested. He doesn't, the Lord wants to fellowship with him. If I'm getting you right, God has no problem with blessing us. God has no problem with blessing God us. God has no problem with coming to your life, providing cars, providing things, but that God is not the starting has a point. problem if you don't get that that is not the point. That is not the starting point. And, and that's not the starting point. And if the starting point for many believers today is normally what they can get from God, and so they miss the starting point. They miss the you starting say point. that the starting point, if I look at chapter 5 of your book, you say the starting point is a death sentence. Yes. Explain what the death sentence is. Okay. Now, before I go that, that way, let me just say that. What will not, um, what the, the problem that came out of this adulterated gospel. Mm. Um, a big confusion in many people's minds today is that they don't see Christianity as a call to a new life. Okay. They see it as a call to an improved life. Okay, and these are fundamentally different. Different. Christianity is a call to a new life, not a call to an improved life. Yes, not that uh, I have improved, you know. I'm a, not that, I mean, let me give um, uh, somebody, an example of somebody that was in sin, and he says, "I'm getting better." The sin is diminishing. It's diminishing, okay. You understand? Or to say, "Well, I thank God, I'm better off now than what I used to be." Mm. But you, you notice that in that book, I mentioned that we need to understand that Christianity is not a call to an improved life but in your life. And that is where we now go ahead to talk about the death sentence. We'll come to the death sentence. We're going to take a break now. But just to recap, you are saying that God calls us to victory. Victory over sin, victory over the world, victory over Satan. And it's a total victory, not a partial victory. When we come back from the break, we will take what you really mean that the starting point is the death sentence. Viewers, I'm talking to Pade Toko, author of this very gripping book, He That Is Born of God. Very meaty in the sense that it takes you into digging into the fundamental. In fact, it's called, subtitled, Fundamental Truths to Transform the Life and Experience of the Believer in Christ. Don't go away. We'll go for a short break and we'll be back. Thank you. Welcome back there, viewers, to this second part of my interview with Pade Tokun, the author of He That Is Born of God. You know, uh, uh, Pade, I had this book given to a friend of mine many years ago, and he just said, look, this has opened my eyes to understand what we have in Christ. It's, 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 for him, it was a step into walking in all that Christ has for him. And that's what you are pushing for. Your goal here is to bring people to a place of liberty and true freedom. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. Before we let, yeah, go ahead and say And uh, several people have written us uh, telling us how much the book has helped them. Mm -hmm. uh, the book came out of a burden when we saw what was happening. In fact, it started in my heart as a kind of a series of um, fact, frequently asked questions. Mm -hmm. you know? That is when I was looking at people's lives and I tried to say, God, what is wrong in this, my brother's life? And I said, suppose this person comes to me. Suppose this person realizes his problem and comes to me. What should I tell him? So I began to study the word of God based on what I was seeing. And that was trying to respond to what I saw as need. And, 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 and for me, this is very important because sometimes in the bid to sugarcoat the gospel, uh, in the bid to say we want to help people, we are by saying, well, let's meet their need. We don't really give them the real meat. And this hinders them from getting the victory because the word of God as it is, if it's rightly understood, will give us the victory that God has called us to. Uh, but we, when we left off before the break, I said in chapter five, you said the entrance, entry point is the death sentence. Can you explain what this death sentence is? Yes, because Christianity means that you finish not with an aspect of a life, but with the totality of it. Uh, I'm going to give you two reasons, so I'm giving you the first one now, uh, because uh, many people see Christianity, the Word of God, as something to use to patch potholes in their lives. You know, you say, well, I know this area of my life is not good, and the Bible says, then it will, it will, it will take that aspect to improve his life. Mm -hmm. No, so 
you are patching, it's like you are patching potholes of your life with part of the gospel. And Jesus says it's not like that. That was why I gave the parable of the, 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 the old wine and the, and wine the new wine skin. Oh, yeah. We don't have time for that. Yeah. Now, uh, um, you did talk about that in a chapter in your book. Yes. Yeah. And the second reason mm. is that several times in the Gospels, in each of the Gospels, Jesus said this several times, the same way he said, if anybody wants to come after me, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross, let him follow me. For whosoever shall save his life will lose it. Will lose it. Mm. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. Now, he says it the same way. Three verses that just follow each other the same way in each of the gospel of the synoptic gospels. Mm. As if that is a standard thing. Mm. And actually it is a standard thing. And you know, those passages are talking about losing his life to get another life. Yeah. You see, losing a life, the life I, I, I have up till now, since I was born till now, mm. even what seems to be my successes, my goodness, losing that life, along with my failures and my, and my bad things, mm. everything together, one package, mm. and starting again with Jesus. Yeah. So, and then, you see, uh, at his, it is that sentence that the Lord uses to operate many things in your life. For example, the principle of deliverance. Mm. Where many people are getting it wrong is that the principle of deliverance from the scriptures, if you look at the New Testament, is not much based on uh, how much a person or who prays for you. It is first of all based on the finished work of Christ to give you this new life. So instead of running around the prophet to pray for you, it yes. is sitting and receiving the finished work of Christ. It is first of all understanding, understanding the, the finished, finished work, work of Christ. Christ that the brings person pray for you mm. must stand upon the finished work of Christ. So it's not so much who prays for you it as much as, as, of who prays as, for much as the finished work of Christ. The finished work of Christ. In fact, there have been examples of people. Because you know what I'm saying? So there's too much running after people today to pray. And it's like the more the anointing of the person, it's the more I'll get my breakthrough. But you're saying that is an illusion. In fact, that is one of the confusion. Yes. We so talk about the speciality of this man of God mm. that we have common what is really supposed to be special, what Christ did. The finished work we of Christ. We have belittled the finished work of Christ. But you say the entry point is a death sentence. Yes. Explain that. Uh, the death sentence uh, means that if I come to Jesus with the mind to follow him, mm. I'm coming knowing that I must lose this life. And mm -hmm. how do I lose this life? Or recognize it. The Bible summarizes it very beautifully in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me read verse 14 for okay. us. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The, let me read verses 14 and 15. Okay. Paul put it beautifully. For the love of Christ constrains us because we judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. That is, if Jesus died for me, I am dead. Mm. You know, Christianity is that, I should understand that actually Jesus died upon the cross, but in reality, in the spiritual interpretation, it was Jesus that died upon the cross, but me, I died. Mm. It is the understanding that the epistles brought us to have when referring to what Christ did in the gospel. Mm. In the gospel, Jesus died on the cross. Mm. We saw him alone. Yeah. In the epistles, the Bible says, it's not only Jesus that died. I died with him. I then. died with him. Mm. And that continues. And that he died for all so that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And that is the Christianity. Mm. That is the summary of the Christianity. Mm. That is, because he died, mm. I'm saying he didn't only die. I've I already died. died. You understand? Mm. That understanding mm. we, we pursued with much intent mm. in this book. Mm. Then when I die, what does it mean? I cannot live a game for myself. Yeah. I cannot live to pursue my desire. So it is, it is this understanding, this revelation that I have died with Christ. That, I that is the Christ. death sentence. That the fact is that death sentence. As Christ died on the cross, I have died with him. With him. When that understanding sinks into a believer, 
And that's the entry point, that as I'm giving my life to Christ, I have died with Christ okay. as he died for me. Yes. And uh, the implication of it, mm. that is the and the implication of it is that, that, that I have died. Mm. I now live for him. Mm. So the life I'm living now, I'm not living uh, based on what I desire. I'm living based on what he wants. He said, I'm no more living unto myself, but I live unto him that died and rose up again. Mm. And, and that, and that I, I'm, I'm going to come in there as we start to learn, but I just want to say, viewers, we're talking from the book, He That Is Born of God, and uh, it's talking about the victorious life that comes from understanding the fundamental truth of the gospel. And uh, it's available on Amazon, on iTunes. Uh, check the links on, the, web, on the, the website and the other links that's on the screen. You can order your copy from those informations on the screen. Uh, it's a book that uh, I personally have distributed and I've seen a lot of people, just like the testimony you gave of that young man, it's been the thing there that a lot of people go like, I've been struggling in this Christian life. It's almost as if I'm in, but I'm not in. But understanding who you are, your heritage, uh, uh, it brings total freedom. He that is born of God overcomes the world. Brother, as we start to learn, there is a, there is a, there are two, two, you know, two extremes I see, and I want you to comment you to comment on it. There is the stream of people who want to take us into religion, where it's wear this, don't wear that. If you want to be right in Christ, you have this, you behave in one way. There's, there's that extreme, which is mainly religion of works. And that's not what you're talking about in this book. You're talking about the victory that comes by faith. But there's also an extreme that we hear today of a, a grace movement where it's, you know, nothing matters, the love of God covers on. Where is the balance? You know, how do you speak into this grace movement? What for you is grace, the grace of God? You know, um, both legalism and um, what the Bible call, let me call it, unbridled freedom. Mm, both, are the, both are the works of the flesh. But the Bible answers this, and I will use all So both of them are the works of the flesh. Yeah, the works of the, the flesh. religious man and the, 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 the liberal man. Both of them. You know mm. what the Bible says in Titus okay. chapter 2? I will read from verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now, that bring, grace brings salvation, but that is not the end. The verse 12 says, it's teaching us that we should deny ungodliness and worthy loss. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace is not a permissive, it's not a permissive virtue. Grace from this passage is very strong. Grace is decisive. Grace does not allow you just to do anything. Mm. In fact, grace has power. Mm. In fact, the grace teaches us to deny mm. ungodliness. People mm. think that grace allows you. No, that is not grace. Mm. No, that is not grace. In fact, we have that's a picture a power, of a grace. That's actually a powerless grace because fact, we have grace a, transforms you. Yes, we have a picture of grace that is feminine. Yeah. But grace is masculine. Mm. Actually, grace... Some people will contend with that in, the, in our day and age, uh, masculine and feminine, but I understand what you're saying. Grace, <laughs> grace is strong. Yeah. Grace says no. Mm. And grace knows when to say yes. Grace is not feeble. It, grace it, is not feeble. It, it doesn't get to a man and the man stays weak. No. It gives man victory. It, it actually works in your life such that your taste will change. In fact, grace enables you. Yeah. It gives you power. Mm to do something. God, grace doesn't just uh, give you license to do anything. It gives you power to live as God wants you to live. Grace gives you power to do what God wants you to do. Mm. So when people talk about uh, we're under grace, it, no, you are not under grace. If you're under grace, you have power to say no. Mm. You should have power to be different. Mm. You have power to say no. Mm. No. If you're really, really living in grace, you will have victory over sin. You have victory over sin. If you're under grace, you have victory. In fact, the Bible says that where sin abounds, mm. In fact, let me extrapolate it. Mm. Where the works of the devil are bound, grace much more abounds. abounds. That is, there's sufficient grace, sufficient grace to resist sin, mm. sufficient grace to resist the devil. That mm. is grace. That's good. Thank you, Brother Day, for coming on the show. Any last word before we go? Well, to just say that uh, the, 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 the word of God is sufficiently powerful. Mm to do the work of God in our lives, you know? Mm. When Jesus say, when Jesus asked people, he said, come unto me, you that labor and heavy laden, mm. I will give you rest. Mm. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. Mm. Jesus, 
is looking for people that will just come and learn of him. And it will infuse power into their life. Amen. Thank you so much, viewers, for joining me in this interview. We'll take a break now. We'll be back to round up later on. Don't go away. Welcome back. I encourage you to get Pade's book. Uh, we, the information we gave you before, you find it on Amazon. You, you see, like Pade was saying, if you study the gospel, you'll find that Jesus always made a dis differentiation between the multitudes and the disciples. The multitudes gathered because of miracles and bread, but the disciples saw Jesus. The multitudes wanted the trills and the spectacle, but the disciples wanted Jesus. Today we have crowds singing about the Lordship of Jesus in our churches while they have no intention of making him Lord in their own lives. But a disciple hungers for Jesus. His passion is to know him and to become like him. Jesus loves the crowd, but he cannot trust them or go into deep things with them. In John 2, 24, it says that Jesus could not commit himself into the hands of uh, the, the people there, only the disciples. He couldn't commit himself into the hands of the multitude. Often Jesus poses this question to those who came to him. What are you looking for? And even today, this is the question he poses to all who come to him. So let me ask you this. What are you looking for? What is the most important pursuit of your life? What is the yearning of your heart? This is what distinguishes the disciple from the multitude. I want to encourage you to pursue what matters most, intimacy with Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, I pray for a fresh hunger and thirst for you to be battered in the heart of everyone watching right now. A fresh re revival of intimacy for Jesus, in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Bye-bye. Please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody else.